Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much, Graham, for your prayers. Yes, I am going to talk about the football. <laughs> I am going to talk about driving. And I am going to talk about being people of the book, because that is the last, where this will be the last uh, sermon in our series looking at that. In fact, I'm going to be talking about three things. Conflict, canon, and cost today. Counting the cost. Gareth Southgate, who seems to have gone up and up and up, quite rightly in everyone's estimation, um, as a manager, when picking his team for this coming Wednesday's semi-final, yes, um, game against Denmark will first look at the ways Denmark's team will plan to attack and break England down. They always say that the first rule of battle is to know your enemy. And I want to talk about our call as the church to know our enemy. It was C.S. Lewis uh, who famously in his screw tape letters, he reminded us of the enemy at work. He personifies and narrates a senior devil teaching a junior devil how to be as disruptive as possible and how to destroy the lives of believers and neutralize the dynamic power of the church to bring hope and healing to the world. If I was the devil, here are some ways I'd break Christians and destroy the church. Because we're called, aren't we, to be aware of the work of the enemy. That Paul, he writes... In Ephesians, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Did Jesus believe in the devil? Yes, he did. But sometimes we in the Western world choose to forget him. Remember that the enemy is a thief. John 10 verse 10, one of my favorite scriptures. Jesus says, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they, that's us, and the world around might have it, that is life, in all its fullness. So here are five ways, I think, if I were the devil, I would seek to destroy the church. Number one, I would distract Christians. I would make their presence as part of the body of Christ feel unimportant and unnecessary. I would lower their sense of worth. I'd fill their lives with distractions, with busyness. Often we used to think of in terms of money, sex and power. <laughs> I think probably personally, I can very easily be distracted by busyness, by box sets, by being successful. Christians... I can be so easily distracted. I don't know about you. Secondly, I divide Christians. Jesus says, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. I would disappoint Christians. I would tell them that God doesn't hear them that he doesn't answer their prayers, I would lower their gaze from the heavens to the broken world around them. 
in the temptations of Jesus, the devil uses the words, if you are, to challenge God's power, to challenge Jesus' identity. And I think very often he challenges our identity. Fourthly, I would demoralize Christians. Make their presence, as I said, as part of the body of Christ, feel unimportant. Paul say, uh, Peter says, I uh, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, look, lion looking for someone to devour him. Someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And fifthly, if I were the devil, I would simply deceive Christians. Jesus said, watch out that no one deceives you. Be aware, in other words, of the wiles of the enemy. In fact, Paul warns the Christians in Colossae. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elementary, elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Paul, of course, warns us. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. And everything that's illuminated becomes a light. That is why it is said, and this is what Paul says, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. It's, it's very eye-opening. I found it very illuminating thinking of how the devil would like to have a go at me. How the devil would like to have a go at Christians. How the devil would like to demoralize and destroy the people of God. So, our challenge is to arm ourselves. Unite in prayer to demolish the strongholds and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Trust in God and his word. And in fact, we take captive every thought that we might have to make it obedient to Christ. And of course, we love one another. Well, we are now going to hear about God's word and Richard is going to come and read to us before I give us a driving lesson. Good morning. It's a privilege to come and read to you this morning. From, 100, from Psalm 119. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light for my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it, that I will follow your righteous laws. I have suffered much. Preserve my life, Lord, according to your word. Accept, Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you so much, Richard. Well, I, uh, one of my joys in training for ministry was once going and visiting Belmarsh High Security Prison and doing a mission in there. It was an extraordinary week that will 
stick with me, not in the least because I met some rather notorious and well-known prisoners. Um, and, uh, and one of the things I very quickly realized in prison ministry was that people in prison were desperate, some of them, to really know Jesus, to really know his love for them, to really know his forgiveness. They would be asking for Bibles, left, right and centre. One of the other things I soon discovered was that when you're in prison, it's rather hard to get hold of cigarettes. But the pages of a Bible, the pages of the Bible are nice and thin and can be very easily ripped out for just that reason. It was an eye-opener to me. Because actually, I think sometimes we can simply tear out the pages of this book. It's like they don't exist. I'm not going to, because I think too highly of this book. In fact, this book is now what I want to talk about. Because I want us to remember how it came about. Particularly the New Testament. How did we get those 27 books passed on to us through the years? Well, let me tell you very briefly the story of how we got these 27 books. Books, starting with, of course, the cross. How was this all put together? When was it completed? Well, let me talk briefly about this 70 ish years. The Old Testament, by the way, the Christians in the Mediterranean, during this little period, were already reading and hearing the stories of the four Gospels. And we think at least ten of Paul's letters were being circulated around the churches of the Mediterranean. They were using them to worship. And of course, they were taking for granted this bit at the beginning of the Bible that we know of as the Old Testament, but the Jewish people, of course, see them as the Hebrew Scriptures. By the end of the first century, the apostolic authors, that's those who'd seen Jesus themselves or whispered like Peter did, to mark, to write down those stories. By the end of the first century, the books of the New Testament were completed. They were finished. Those They put their pens down, or their quills, as it were. Let's talk then about this period. I want to tell you about a bad boy called Marcion. He was round about here, 144 AD. Marcion decided, in fact, I think he might have stirred and spurred on the saints to get on and stick the Bible together, as it were. He decided he was going to make up his own version of the New Testament to suit what he thought was important about Jesus. So what he did was he literally tore out the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament. He tore out Matthew. He took out the bit at the beginning of Luke. There was no birth story of Jesus. Why? Because he couldn't stand Jewish people. 
So he literally tore out anything at all Jewish in those books. I mean, it's quite amazing. Of course, he was soon caught, as it were, and told, be off, be off. That is not the way we are going to remember Jesus. But it was interesting that he made up his own version to suit what he wanted to say. So early on, people were tearing out bits of the Bible they didn't want. We can sometimes do that in the same way. Round about here, a French bishop called Irenaeus of Lyon decided to write a book called Against Heresies when he named a number of heresies, including Gnosticism, which I've talked about previously, named them and shamed them as it were and said, actually, we need to live instead like this. And he mentioned the four Gospels. He said who they were written by. This is, a, this is AD 170. And said, look, people, this is who we're going to talk about Jesus and we're going to remember him like this. Going on to this spot here now, one of our predominant historians of these early years is a man called Eusebius. Eusebius lived in Caesarea, which is a very nice place on the Mediterranean coast, uh, a few miles from Jerusalem, as it were. And he, uh, he decided to write down the discussions that were going on about the New Testament. He said that there are three kinds of book. The first is the genuine Gospels, most of the letters. They're true, they're not forged, and they're admitted. Then he said there's some that are disputed. He was scratching his head about them. Some of the books indeed were. 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John were a bit like that. They were like, how do these fit with the Jesus we know? And he said there's a third lot. They're heretical. There's a, a pretty odd ones. In fact, I've got to say my favorite one of these is the book called The Acts of Andrew. Now, I wish I had got hold of a copy and read The Acts of Andrew. It didn't make it into the New Testament, probably for very obvious reasons. We just don't know. I know it's called The Acts of Andrew. We don't know who wrote them. We don't know who authored those books. So how did Eusebius decide? Because it was him who Constantine, remember him, wrote to in about 331 and said, listen, I'm building a new city, Constantinople. The churches, they're packed out with Christians. Now that, of course, I made it the state religion, rather helps. And they need some Bibles. Can you give me 50 copies of the Bible? So Eusebius sent off 50 copies to Constantinople. How did he choose the books in the New Testament? One, they've got apostolic or orthodox contents. Two, they are widely accepted by the churches. And three, as I said, they've got that origin that really is linked with the people who actually saw Jesus. It was the bishop in, of Alexandria in, in 367, round about here. He actually wrote down the 27 books in his letter to his diocese, that we've got a record of, those 27 books. By the end of the 4th century, we had the New Testament that has been handed down to us. Andy, tell me, why are you going on all about this? It's got nothing to do with football. <laughs> Andy, why does it matter? 
because it matters how we treat and hold God's word. It was told by people who saw Jesus. It was told. By the end of the first century, it was complete. By the end of the fourth, they had a few councils round about here. It was settled for sure. But it was told by people who actually saw Jesus. Not just that. It was wrestled over by saints determined to get it passed on accurately and to keep out the lies of the enemy. And thirdly, it will settled and treated as holy. And it's a challenge to us to be careful how we use it. We need to wield it with kindness, with clarity and humility. It is God's gracious truth. It's the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, last book in the Bible. In his last few words, he writes, he says, I warn anyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. What a warning! And if anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this scroll. Without God's word, there is no doubt without this sifting to get that, as it were, the pure word of God. Without that, there's no doubt that Christians, as, a, as Paul the Apostle describes, would be tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery and by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. That's what he says. We've talked about the conflict. We've talked about the canon. I want to talk about the cost. Luke 9 is a chapter that speaks a number of times about the cost of being a disciple. Jesus said, Then uh, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? And Paul, talking about freedom that we now have as Christians, he says... We've got a right to do anything. But not everything is beneficial. We've got a right to do anything. But not everything is constructed. That's why I think the cones are handy for the highway code analogy. We know, don't we, that actually if we get in a car... We can drive on whatever side of the road we want. We can drive wherever we want. We can drive as fast as we want. Don't I know it? But we know that it is not beneficial to us or those around us to do so. Which is why we have a highway code to keep us safe. One theologian warns, the modern ideal of individual freedom and dignity does not sit well with the idea of a canon that requires submission. So I want to encourage us to recognize, and I think we know, that there's a cost to living the way 
of the cross. Friends, how do we treat God's word? Do we use it to light our path and guide the many small decisions of every day that make us who we are? And do we enable, do we use it to walk obediently? I want to encourage us never to dismiss or tear out anything from it. Let us not be ensnared by the enemy, the devil. Let's not stray from God's word. He's got such goodness for each of us because he loves each one of us so much. He loves his church and he loves his world. May God's will, oh God's word, give us all the joy we ever need to live life in all its fullness. Let's see God's word for what it is. God's highway code to living obediently, to living out God's kingdom, being salt, light, yeast, and bringing healing and hope to the world around us. Amen.